Uh, okay, everyone, what's up? Goldie here. And we're back. Um, I've been kind of out of commission here for the last little while. But we have projections, we got ownership, we now also have a uh, an egregiously long breakdown. So let's uh, let's get into it. We get, we're going to go over the uh, eight-game main slate here on Monday, August 14. Um, we got, you know, we're, we're kind of getting into the dog days here in baseball. It's at this point where it starts to get to be a, a pretty big grind. You know who is good, you know who's bad, you know who we want to attack, you know who we want to fade, um, you know who we want to play, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and hopefully at this point in the season we got a pretty damn good idea, at least, you know, certainly for starting pitchers, but hitters as well, um, as to price tags and, you know, who's going to be getting some run here at the – uh, latter part of the season, as far as guys that just got called up, we've got stabilized rosters now with the trade deadline uh, having passed a couple weeks ago, et cetera, et cetera. So now is really kind of when you start grinding. I know people are, uh, you know, a lot of the market gets kind of sick of playing baseball five, six months in and gets really excited for football. But um, that's typically when I've certainly had my best results. And I, I suppose, you know, Sheets could certainly, um, you know, corroborate that, uh, you know, he's been on a little bit of a heater recently uh, in baseball as well. Uh, it's this time of year when people don't play attention, don't pay attention rather, and start to play other sports or um, quit playing baseball that, you know, you can really capitalize on some edge here. And if we do our, our typical research um, and stay sharp, then there's still a, I mean, there's still tournaments running, right? There's still a hell of a lot of money to be made and a lot of fun to be had uh, playing baseball this deep into the year. So that said, spiel aside, we do have projections and ownership loaded, um, so feel free to peruse those. Uh, everything should be up on the site, as well as push to SaberSim uh, for those with the um, upgraded SaberSim package, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, Let's just get into the games. We've got... Um, a decent breakdown here. Not a lot of red numbers on the mound, to be honest. So a lot of these guys, to one degree or another, are actually pretty pay playable today. So let's just start here up at the top. I've got Quinn Priester here going for the Pirates against the Mets at City Field. Um, Pittsburgh hasn't officially announced anybody yet. So we don't have a line on the game or like who knows what the hell freaking Sheldon's doing over here. Um so I've got Priester in there. Most of the industry is projecting him, so we're just going to go over him here. Uh, I'm not going to play him, however. He's one of the few guys I don't really want to deal with tonight. Um, we've got some a lot of short sample noise, right? Eight and three quarters ERA here with expected metrics pointing far, far lower. As you can see here, I've uh, developed a little bit of a, a custom metric here called, and I'm just, I'm just calling it expected suppression. Um, and we, I'm using this to... Uh, as a, a production efficiency sort of gauge, the same way we were using, um, you know, the XERA and the XFIP earlier in the season, I have developed a uh, just kind of a, a custom metric here. It's basically um, going to give us a, a pretty good idea as to how much regression we could expect in the suppression categories, uh, the run suppression categories, that is. Uh, going forward, and that's, uh, you know, we we like to see negative numbers if we're looking for positive regression for pitchers. Um, positive numbers are going to suggest that uh, guys are perhaps running a little bit hot. Um, you know, that said, a an expected metric here of uh, pushing five and a half in the suppression is still not good. Um, you know, despite the fact that uh, we've got some short sample noise here, he's got a whip of buck 90 here he's walking everybody right 15 percent walk rate to the lefties here so far just 60 hitters 55 hitters you know to the right hander so very short samples can't really take anything out of the pitch mix or the values just yet or specifically the pitch mix values we can take some of course out of uh the distribution um Full five pitches, which is encouraging, but mostly a sinker baller here. Doesn't really have an out pitch. Doesn't have a swing and miss pitch, and we see that materialize here at just a sub, you know, 9.5% swing strike rate, give or take. 17.5% um, raw K rate with a 13.5, or 13, rather, percent walk rate, 
is not great. Just a 25% CSW. We need to see all of this tick up quite a bit. Priester projects as just a, a control type of guy. Um, you know that's going to be able to survive. He's gonna, he's a he'll be a finesse type of pitcher. Certainly at the at this time, um, you know he's not displaying any swing and miss whatsoever. Not inducing um, a lot of strikes necessarily, right? With the CSW at at the 25%, and he's got control problems, right? So still a young arm, and they're just gonna kind of give him a little bit of run and see what they want to do with it. By most accounts, so. Really, the only sort of saving grace here for Priester so far is is decent two-seamer value. Okay, this is going to be his money-making pitch because he stays down in the strike zone with it, inducing a lot of ground balls at a buck ninety-five per to both sides. But of course, the issue is pitching to a bit too much contact here. Let's you know, seventy-seven percent raw contact rate is not horrific. Uh, but a two-ninety XBA is starting to get a little bit concerning here. Uh, that's a you can't give up a 290 batting average um, to anybody. I don't care who you're facing. And the Mets, you know, they make a lot of contact over here. So it's a, a pretty dangerous spot, um, really no matter how you slice it. He's obviously running bad in terms of power allowed, uh, right? We've got a, a roughly a 265 ISO allowed. Um, and again, with the, the huge 300 batting average. But the expected metrics are pointing far lower, Um and of course, the you know three and a half runs worth of suppression also pointing to the downside for him as well. So eventually, he's going to be able to figure it out. Uh, I generally do kind of like going after the Mets sometimes, um, but I'm going to leave Priester on the shelf. I just think he needs more swing and miss. I don't like that he's just a two seamer type of guy. I think we can get to a, a couple of Mets stacks over here, despite the fact that we're playing in a big ballpark. Um, against a guy that induces a lot of ground balls. I've got no problem playing Frankie Alvarez. His problem is strikeouts, right? 3,900, he'll likely be up at the top of the lineup, but who the hell knows what Showalter's going to do. You might throw him down in the nine hole or something. Um, Buck has kind of lost his marbles sometimes. Um, Frankie Lindor, I've got no problem. Looks like he's okay with the side he was dealing with over the last week or so. Pete Alonso, of course. Um, mix him in as well. We want to be careful with some of these other ground ball type of hitters like a Jeff McNeil. Um, even though they're cheap and in the middle of the lineup, right, the batter ball profile does not play into their favor. 5,300 has to put Quinn Priester in play if you land on him because he's, well, he's very contrarian, number one. He's super cheap, number two. You can play whoever the hell you want. And he's going to allow you to get to a lot of Arizona and potentially a Scherzer or a Glasnow on the mound as well. So he's in play due to price tag, but really it's just a price tag for me only that's going to keep him down here. I think there's upside for him to survive for 15, 18, 20 points here. And at 5,300, that's generally perfectly uh, acceptable. Um, even against the Mets, they're generally a, a pretty low upside lineup, right? Just a 103 WRC plus against righties this season, but they don't strike out and swing and miss a lot. Still hit first, a, a sneaky bit of pop. That's mostly coming from, of course, Frankie Lindor, Pete Alonso, and a little bit of the Frankie Alvarez. Um, short stacks, mostly, I think, for me with the Mets. Uh, I do like a little bit of Brandon Nimmo here, 4,300. I think this is a fine play. Uh, from the left side of the plate, getting a lot of a two-seamer over here from Priester. Same thing with Frankie Lindor. 5,100's fine. 54 for PD is fine. Um, you can mix in a Danny Vogelbach if you come off of PD. You can mix in some Jeff McNeil if you get to full Mets, Mets stacks because he's in the middle of the lineup. He's dual eligible. He's 3,500. Like, go ahead. Uh, so I have, I have no serious problem with that, but they're a little bit down the board for me. Um... I think there is upside for them at their relative price tags going after some Priester here because he's still giving up pop. Let's not get it confused here. Um, you know, he can't stop anybody from scoring, and that's a problem. So um, do we want to generally go after him? Uh, I think it's okay, but uh, generally not with a pretty low upside lineup like the Mets. So um, I think both sides are in play. Interesting tournament spot. I'm not super interested in either side, but um, both definitely playable in tournaments. Cookie on the other side, if I got to choose between these two guys, I'd rather just play Cookie. I trust him a little bit more, but that's not to say I trust Cookie uh, because I think he's probably due to get bludgeoned 
uh, once again. He's been okay recently. You know, it's still up and down. He's given up way too much pop, man, and it's mostly to the right side this season. As we see down here with a 247 ISO, full 308 batting average allowed. He's also got a 295 XBA, and that's really to both sides. Uh, 384 Woba. Is, or x woba rather is elevated man he's given up a full 221 xi so these are huge and very attackable numbers 11 percent raw barrel rate with a 10 percent walk rate he's only got a 16 percent k rate himself and a 25 26 percent csw2 trouble throwing strike one still for cookie so i've got no problems going after him with the pirates they're actually a very viable stack here tonight because they're all mega cheap. Brian Reynolds, I know he hit two bombs yesterday in the in the second game of the doubleheader against the Reds, but he's 4,300 still, and like Cookie's got, it's not like he's got um, you know elite stuff against the left side. He, he's only got 13% strikeout rate to the lefties here. Still gives up a 161 ISO and a 273 batting average with a 14% walk rate. Um, now he'll induce some ground balls, so we want to air on the side of fly ball hitters a little bit if we can stomach it that's jack sawinski territory 3300 of course we really like him in this spot uh but i have interest in a lot of these right handers as well brian hayes really against right he's not hitting as many ground balls this season as he has in the past uh still a ground ball hitter of course uh with the ground ball lean and not all that high upside necessarily um you know, but at, he's just had a buck ten ground ball to fly ball against right-handers this season. Doesn't create it at all, just an 80 WRC plus. Not a lot of power there, but only a 20, 22% strikeout rate, give or take, and, and a neutral ground ball to fly ball. Um, so he's at a playable price tag at 3,800. He'll be in the middle of the lineup very likely as well. He's fine to mix in in some stacks here uh, with mostly lefties. Pittsburgh going to try and probably platoon a little bit, but I do like a Henry Davis in the outfield. Um, assuming he is not hurt. I don't think he is. Uh, he should be fine. And in there with the likes of Brian Reynolds, McCutcheon, um, and Sawinski, right? Uh, Josh Palacios, they'll probably lead him off, etc. Et so all these guys are very, very cheap. Uh, Reynolds is the most expensive at 4300 So uh, no problem getting to Pittsburgh today. They'll probably be a pretty popular filler stack here with Arizona and the Cardinals, for example, maybe the Braves. Um I know we've kind of gone over a lot in this game, but I think it's a very viable tournament game to target, even though this is in kind of a bad ballpark. That's really what takes me off a little bit. Um, I don't like shorting super cheap price tags on pitchers generally. But I think Cookie's bad at ball profile here this full season has really displayed that he's not going to bring anything all that impressive to the table. Same thing with Quinn, Pri Quinn Priester here so far in the early going of his career. So uh, no problem getting to some offense here. If you land on a couple of these, either one of these guys on the mound, however, I don't think that's horrible either. We got some sneaky OK value scores here in the mid 20s for guys down, you know, 6,000 and below. So, you know, you could make worse plays, um, you know, like playing Chris Flex in a Coors Field, for example. So both of these guys are in play, but offense um, mostly. My favorite's going to be Pittsburgh, shorter stacks, the Mets. But I think uh, a lot of angles are really here in play. Very interesting game. Okay, let's move on to the Yankees and the Braves. Try and get through things a little bit quicker. Don't want to spend 20 minutes on every game. Clark Schmidt on the mound, 7,700. Now, fundamentally, I think he could battle here against the Braves. I really don't like going after Atlanta. You need guys that have a lot of swing and miss uh, and really don't have all that many weaknesses because they've got some guys over here, notably Ozzy Albies, Ronald Acuna, of course, at the top of the lineup that don't really strike out. Um, now, Matt Olson's going to strike out, right? But Marcelo Zuna in the middle, he historically he got a, a lower strikeout rate. He'll strike out a little bit against right-handers a little bit. Austin Riley, though, only about 22%. It's above average for a hitter. Um, you know, Michael Harris down at the bottom of the lineup, only a 19% K rate against right-handers. They're difficult to get through outside of a couple of guys like an Eddie Rosario who strikes out at 25%. Osuna against the righties, as I mentioned. Matt Olson at 23%. Uh, Sean Murphy striking out at 25% clip or so. But that's really as far as it goes. Everybody else is 20% uh, or below. And pretty damn good hitters, if I do say, my, say so myself. So when I'm going after Atlanta, I need guys with a lot of swing and miss and very few holes. 
And unfortunately for Clark Schmidt, he's got a really big hole against the left side of the plate. This cutter is just never really developed into the pitch that he wanted it to be. Still giving up power on it, a full 214 ISO with a 286 batting average, 373 WOBA, and that's not necessarily because of a huge walk rate, just 9%. That's a respectable figure. So it's contact here because he's only pitching to about an 18% strikeout rate to the lefties. Neutral ground ball to fly ball. He gives up some pop here, and he's still very much attackable. Now, unfortunately, Ozzy Albee's freaking 6,000 now. He's got good power numbers against the left, or from the left side against right-handers this year, but he only hits about 230. And outside of that, you know, he doesn't walk a whole hell of a lot, just an 8% walk rate. So he's going to hit the ball out uh, or just make some pretty mediocre type of contact. Um, and he's about a neutral WRC+. plus, So that's not all that impressive at a 6,000 price tag necessarily, even though he's got 23 jacks, right, against right-handed pitching this season. Um, Acuna's up to 67, Austin Riley 62, Matt Olson 65, Sean Murphy's still 55, right? Nothing new here with the Braves. Um, it's it's going to be very difficult to stack them. It's pretty much impossible to full stack the Braves unless you double punt on the mound and probably double punt your or um, you know punt your secondary stack as well. So that's why I think Clark Schmidt could be survivable here a little bit. 7,700, I'm not super thrilled about the price tag. I'm I'm questioning the vulnerability here against the left side of the plate, but he's pretty damn good against the righties, you know. Uh, unfortunately, the righties over here are Austin Riley, Ronald Acuna, um, and Ozuna, who's got pretty okay numbers this season, at least from a power perspective. Each one of these guys has an ISO over 200 outside of Orlando Arcia and Michael Harris. Michael Harris is at about a 170 against righties. So super difficult lineup to go after. Not a lot of strikeout stuff. Over the last two and a half months, they've only been striking out at about a 17% clip against right-handers. 7,700 leaves it on the table for me a little bit. I think it's kind of difficult. Uh, with this batted ball profile, I think he could survive at a buck 15 ground ball to fly ball because most of the guys over here, you know, outside of Ozzy Albies, Matt Olson from the left side, um, they will hit ground balls, right? They have slight ground ball lean. So that does play into Schmitty's uh, batted ball profile here uh, a, a little bit. Um, gives him a slight advantage. But it's this is still Atlanta, and it's still going to be incredibly difficult for him. Um what really attracts me mostly and what would put me on to him is some super low ownership. I hate playing him when he's mega popular and in a really difficult matchup. Uh, but super low ownership kind of uh, prices that in, so to speak. So sub 5%, I've got no problem getting 5-8% of Clark Schmidt here, taking some shots and D tournaments against Atlanta. Um, they're, they're just too expensive. I'm going to continue to fade them. And it's going to continue to bite me in the ass, unfortunately. They're probably the most, they've got to be the most tilting team in baseball uh, this season because they're insanely expensive. They're too hard to get to every day, uh, and they still get there on you every single day. So, um, you know, for, for guys that like me that do a lot of fundamental and, and price analysis, um, it takes them out of play for me a lot. And that really stinks because <laughs> they get there every damn day. So I think I might try and fade them a little bit here tonight with Clark Schmidt. Uh, I'm not super thrilled about it, but I think that is in play. Max Fried going for the Braves, 9,400 for him, 16% ownership. I think this is fine. Talked about, I mean, briefly with some Logan Gilbert. Um, you know, he's not seen a lot of ownership either. And similar ownership number here for Max Fried. I think this is a fine spot. However... We do need to be a little bit careful here. He's he's heavy, heavy ground ball guy is Max Fried from the left um, uh, to the right-handers, rather. Um, he's obviously elite against the left side. He induces a lot of ground balls there. Good bit of swing and miss, too. We can have a short sample on him because he's been hurt so much this year, but uh, he's historically been you know near a two-to-one ground ball to fly ball guy, and that makes him really difficult to attack. His strikeout stuff has been, you know, he's hovered mostly around league average this season, you know, in the short seven start sample that we have for him. He's up about three ticks to that. So that's encouraging. And he's got a full five pitches. I love the pitch mix. I don't don't really like the sinker that he throws it at all, but it still keeps him down in the strike zone. And when he's getting value, 
out of every other one of the pitches. He's always had good four-seam command, great curveball, and a really good change as well, throwing in this slider getting value. Also, um, you know, that makes him very serviceable, and you can get away with a you know negative value on one pitch. So uh, I've got no problem playing some Max Fried here against the Yankees. This is in Atlanta, and we do have to be a little bit careful. So if you want to go after him and take some shorts at a 9400 price tag, we do generally have upside concerns with Max Fried. Sometimes can't pitch to a little bit too much contact. Control can kind of wane for him sometimes. Um, and the strikeout stuff just isn't there. On occasion, he just gets too many ground balls, and it kind of caps his upside. So we're taking a little bit of risk here at 9400 concerning or uh, considering that. So if you want to take some shots on him, you know, hanging to baseball a little bit, this sinker value just really not being there for him, then I think that's okay. If you want to get to some Judge, 64, you got to pay for it, of course, but it's Judge. We don't really care about that. You pay for some Glaber at 4,400. I'm okay stomaching that price tag. 3,300, high fly ball hitter for Harrison Bader. That's fine. 46 for Stanton is okay. He's about a neutral ground ball to fly ball guy, generally against lefties, and he kind of stinks. Um, no, but he still has all the power in the world if he can make contact. So I have no real issue they're similar to the Mets for me I think I like the Mets a little bit more definitely against Priester I don't want to go after Max Freed but I think it is very viable to mix in some short Yankee stacks as a super contrarian play today uh, however I just most likely like to side with uh, Max Freed here because his ownership is, is more attractive um, I think both he and Logan Gilbert are not going to get a lot of traction today and I think there is an exploitable um sort of inefficiency in the marketplace that we could attack there. So uh, I like some free Braves, sure, if you can make it happen. But, like, my goodness, you, get, you have to play Eddie pretty much. You have to play Michael Harris because everybody else is just too damn expensive. You can't make it happen otherwise. So um, really hard to make Brave stacks happen. So, you know, I naturally just come in under the field, even if they come in at 5%. It's very hard to get there with them um, in full stacks because they're so expensive and you need all of them to get there because still the only one that's creating for them is Acuna. So um, interesting tournament game there for sure. But uh, let's move on since I'm yapping quite a bit. Oakland and the Cardinals. JP Sears on the mound, 7,400. I think the price tag's a bit too high for him. Um, it certainly is for me against the Cardinals here tonight. Now, do I want to play the Cardinals? Well, I don't know. It, like This offense is really frustrating. Even though they're a pretty good offense, right? 120, 110 WRC plus, 22.5% K rate, buck 70 ISO nearly, 38% hard contact against lefties. Really attractive there. Uh, they still only have a few guys that you're all that thrilled with playing. Now, Wilson Contreras, 3,600. He's back down into very playable price tags, not up at the 5,000 he was after he heated up a little bit. Uh, I like him at 3,600. We can get to that. You can get to Tyler O'Neill, 3,700, even though he's historically got a little bit better power numbers against right-handers than lefties. Um, we want some slight ground ball hitters here because J.P. Sears induces a hell of a lot of ground balls, or excuse me, fly balls. So we want some ground ball hitters with some line drive type of lean. Uh, and that's Nolan Arenado. That's Paul Goldschmidt territory, certainly. You want to play a little bit of Tommy Edmond? I think that's okay. I don't like him at 3,900 down in the 6 or the 7 hole, wherever they stick him. If he's leading off, that's okay. I don't know what the hell Ollie Marmel's doing over here, leading off Lars against left-handers, uh, but they need to figure that out. Nolan Gorman probably going to stay off it. He might not even be in the list tonight. Uh, I do like some Jordan Walker here. He's a ground ball hitter and makes a lot of really good contact. Um, I think that's okay. I'm not kind of lukewarm for the most part on the Cardinals. Favorites are going to be Aaron Nato, Contreras, and like a Jordan Walker, I think. Uh, price adjusted. But you can certainly throw in, like, don't leave off Paul Goldschmidt if you're stacking the Cardinals or anything like that, right? Uh, or Tyler O'Neill. So I think they're perfectly fine going after some JP Sears. He's generally frustrating to stack against sometimes because he induces so many fly balls. and doesn't give up a lot of hard contact, but he will give up some barrels, right? Full 13% barrel rate. That's still way too high. He's on the barrel to really both sides and attackable there, giving up a 216 ISO to lefties and a 214 ISO to righties. In aggregate, he's running a little bit hot, as a matter of fact, with a 218 X ISO. So uh, he will give up some power. I'd mostly like to just kind of homer hunt here uh, with well-adjusted uh, or 
the well price adjusted guys like Jordan Walker. Arenado, I think, is really intriguing. He's, of course, got excellent numbers over his career against lefties. So uh, that's fine. And a Wilson Contreras behind the plate. I think that is very viable. Those three guys, though, I think are probably going to be pretty popular. Um, Tyler O'Neill as well. So you'll have to balance a little bit of ownership. I wouldn't get too crazy with it in, like, Arizona stacks necessarily. But uh, that's probably my favorite way to attack J.P. Sears. I'm going to leave him mostly on the shelf because I got pretty um, serious power concerns here, of course, and a little bit of upside concern for being able to run deep enough into a game uh, against a what's likely to be a, a very righty-heavy lineup and a, still a, a very good lineup. Um, Michael is on the mound for the Cardinals. He's seen 33 35% ownership right now, and I, I just can't do it with him, man. Uh, this is one of the best matchups he's going to get, right? And Michaelis has a tendency to do that, pop really hard against bad teams. Uh, he, he even does it sometimes against good teams. I think he, earlier this season he had an outing against uh, Houston or something. Um where he just popped, no, it was against, uh, who was it? Uh, he popped against the Reds, he popped against Tampa uh, a little bit, uh, the White Sox, where he just went crazy. You know, these are average teams, but for the most part, Michaelis just doesn't have all that much upside, right? And I think you're, I, I'm personally incurring too much risk at 35% ownership on a guy. Yeah, yeah, sure, I like the price tag, I like the matchup, of course, against Oakland, Um but I don't like the batter ball profile still. He doesn't throw it past anybody, right? And he still has 24% line drive rate. It's ticking downward over his last two starts against Minnesota and Tampa. Um, he's gone seven innings in each, and he's dropped a line drive rate quite a bit. But he's still getting a tag for a couple of runs. And those couple of runs, since he doesn't throw it past anybody, could very well turn into five or six. Um And all of a sudden, you're dead in the water, having eaten 40% ownership on the guy. So... I'm going to come in underweight. I think you have to have exposure in tournaments for sure because he's going to make a lot of stuff happen at this $7,000 price tag. But I'm going to come in underweight because I hate the line drive rate, man. If he induced a lot more ground balls, we talked about this several times with Michael, is, then I could stomach a higher line drive rate. But at a neutral ground ball to fly ball, um, I can't stomach a 24% line drive rate. It's just too high. And hard contact rates pushing 32% here. It's, it's just too much for my liking even though he's efficient early in the count and he's efficient late in the count he doesn't walk a lot of guys he still is an okay pitcher um a suppression type of guy right and running right in line for the most part with his expected metrics perhaps running a little bit hot with a you know 71 percent strand rates because he doesn't throw it past anybody um so these guys that can get on base here he's susceptible to, to letting them come around to score a little bit. So um, I'm lukewarm on Michaelis and, and mostly kind of, um, you know, going to throw him out with the bathwater. You know, uh, I'm going to come in underweight on it, and it's probably going to bite me in the ass again, as it has a couple of times. But um, I don't like this very high ownership figure on him. Yeah, I like the projection. I like the price. I like the matchup. But I don't like hit the underlying fundamentals for him. Um, and I – a lot of times I need all th three or all four of those categories for me to really get excited about eating a lot of ownership on a guy. So that's kind of where I am on Michaelis. Um, that means I'll probably have to have some Oakland with like some JJ Blade. Like all these guys are mega cheap. I'm going to have my token Seth Brown every single day, some Soderstrom behind the plate while he's still under 3000. I mean, it's just too cheap for the kid. Um, et cetera, et cetera. All of these guys are very, very cheap and they will make the, expensive Arizona stacks and expensive pitching happen for you. So I think that's how I'm going to try and structure this a little bit, even though I do like getting to some Michaelis in some deeper tournament stuff. Um, you know, the ownership is gonna, just going to take me off. So give me some Oakland on the other side. Okay, let's move on. Angels in Texas. Patty Sandoval, 7,200. I really hate this matchup for him. So I'm unfortunately going to have to probably come off of it. But I, I like playing Patty a little bit in good matchups uh, against teams that will hit it on the ground. Now, Texas is not necessarily one of those, right? Just a neutral ground ball to fly ball for them in aggregate. We've got a lot of fly ball hitters over here. Um, now, one of them, notably Josh Young, is out for the season, of course. Mitch Garver, he might not even be in there because Jonah Heim is back. Addy Garcia hits it in the air. Semyon, of course, hits it in the air. Corey Seager will hit it in the air. Uh, Nate Lowe, a little bit of a ground ball type of guy. But Zeke Duran 
and Leody Tavares, both from the right side, Robbie Grossman, like these guys can lift the baseball a little bit. And I think that is kind of dangerous against Patty because he induces so many ground balls, buck 80 per. He doesn't give up any power, though, so that's what always puts him in play for me. I, I really need him to develop a swing and miss pitch. Uh, he just doesn't have it. Just a 19% strikeout rate. Patty, at this point, is really just a, a finesse type of pitcher himself. Um, the fastball this season is, is really what's been an issue for him and not being able to induce a lot of swing and miss, and he's only got a 60% strike one rate. We need this a little bit higher if we're going to get excited about playing Patty in bad matchups, and Texas is a bad matchup. Now, 7,200, though, makes him a good price pivot, and it's certainly a good ownership pivot off of very chalky Miles Michaelis. Excuse me. However, you want to be very careful going after Texas, especially in Texas, with somebody that's not going to throw it past him. So um, I'm, I'm going to come in under... Uh, well, certainly under like 10%. I might get with the field, you know, five, eight teams or, or you know, 8% or whatever, or whatever with um, some Patty Sandoval here. But yeah, I want to be careful with this because I hate going after Texas, man, especially with Corey Seager. I mean, if it weren't for Shohei, like Corey Seager would be running away with the freaking MVP in the AL. Like this kid is such a damn good hitter. He just has to stay healthy, and if he can stay healthy, like you're seeing what healthy Corey Seager can do. It's every freaking day with this kid. He is elite, so I have no problem playing Texas if you can get to them and make it happen, but Semyon, Seager, and Addy Garcia are a mega expensive, 61, 63, and 58 respectively, so I'm not super thrilled about going after Patty at those price tags with those guys. Um... Yeah, but I'm okay mixing in a Joan Heim or a Mitch Garver behind the plate. They're both very playable. Joan Heim's been great from both sides this season. And you'll have to probably mix in a Zeke Duran or a Leote uh, or maybe a Robbie Grossman, something like that, if you full stack. I'm not crazy about it. I think I'd probably – I mean, I I have to side with Texas because I always side with Texas. Uh, but I think it's okay to mix in a couple of Patty teams, and I think I might have a couple here, simply due to the very high ground ball rate, even though it it's – not the greatest batted ball matchup. Uh, he's still inducing two ground balls per fly ball. So, you know, it, it's still in our favor that he's not going to get completely torched here. Um, but he'll pitch to some contact, and, you know, we got to be careful with that. Scherzer on the mound for the Rangers at 11000 It's just the price tag and the ownership, man. Like, it's going to be very hard for me to get super excited about this. I love the plate discipline, of course. And as we mentioned, Scherzer's kind of rounding into form here. Still giving up pop, right? 215 ISO to the, to the righties and 165 ISO realized to the lefties this season. Uh, strikeouts and, and the stuff, you know, suppression-wise against the right side, still very good. But he's given up two homers per nine there. He's a fly baller. Flyball pitcher at 070 ground balls per, that gives up 32% hard contact. And you can't give up this many fly balls and get on the barrel as much as he has this season at a full 10% and not get taken apart a little bit. You know, a 4 ERA is not nothing. So I'm looking still for a little bit of um, variance with Max Scherzer despite a very, very high strike. One rate, 70%, good chase at 31%. Swing strikes are great. We want to see some more called strikes out of him. That's really the change-up slider curveball combination here. The secondaries are really kind of leading him astray. He's not able to induce a lot of called strikes. That's what's keeping the CSW down here at 28%. And that's an average figure for a starting pitcher. This is still Max Scherzer, and he's still got elite strikeout stuff to the right side, but he's only got a 22.5% K rate to the lefties this year. Also giving up just as many fly balls and some homers. He's got a homer problem, full 5% home run rate with a 10% barrel rate. That's attackable. And with an 83% strand rate, I'm still expecting a little bit of negative regression in terms of run suppression for Scherzer, even though the suppression metrics say that he's right in line with where he should be. Um, strand rate, not so much. 83% is just not sustainable. So now he's one of the elite arms. He could could sustain you know a 79% strand rate, but 79% or let me say it differently, 83% is not 79%. So 
Um, and 11,000 is 11,000. 30 plus percent ownership is 30 plus percent ownership. So uh, I'm probably just going to have to come in under simply because I want to play some more expensive offenses and I want to play a boatload of Arizona. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, and eating a lot of ownership on your starting pitcher and your offense is generally not a super equitable way to win tournaments in baseball. Uh, I've got no problem playing him, of course, because he still has whiffs, right? And this is still a fine matchup because the Angels have been absolutely horrific recently. They've gotten taken apart by J.P. France and freaking, um, you know, whoever just threw the other day. Uh, their name is escaping me at the moment. Um, nevertheless, they have, you know, since Trout went down, this and they thought that acquiring Mike Moustakis and C.J. Crone and Randall Grichik from Colorado was an equitable way to uh, sustain, you know, the positive offensive production. Uh, you know, ever since Trout went down, this team has cratered offensively. So they're very much attackable with Scherzer because, as I mentioned, the plate discipline is overall pretty damn good still. Um, and he's still got a lot of upside, not necessarily at 11,000, though. So you got to pay for this. Um, so I'll probably end up just coming in under. I, you know, honestly, I'd rather pivot it to Tyler Glass now, who's 200 cheaper. Um, and what half the ownership? We'll get to that in a bit. So that's kind of how I want to structure this game. Give me, yeah, give me some Shohei, absolutely. Um, but I don't really want to play Mickey Moniak, 4,700. He strikes out too much. I want to play any of the righties because I don't think they're very good. CJ Crone, maybe you could land on that. He's, you know, makes fine contact, neutral ground ball to fly ball against righties, has pop. Uh, Hunter Renfro, fine. You know, whatever doesn't strike out a hell of a lot. But uh, do you want to go out of your way to do that? Not really. So Shohei mostly, um, and some Scherzer and some Texas, if I can make it happen. Okay, let's move on. Seattle and Kansas City. Uh, Logan Gilbert, here he is, 9,700, similar to Max Fried. I want to play this, man. It, like, show me, show me why I should not be attacking the Royals. Um, there's not a single number that's going to tell me to stay away from him, whether it's on the side of Logan Gilbert. It's 25% K rate, good suppression. Gives up some fly balls and a little bit of hard contact to left-handers, yeah. Um, but not translating to a hell of a lot of power and not necessarily to balls over the wall either. He doesn't walk people. So from his perspective, I'm okay going after a bunch of left-handers over here that strike out a lot, right? Notably, a Michael Massey, MJ Melendez, uh, Kyle Isbell types, Um you know, these guys have swing and miss in them from the right side. That's, you know, the platoon advantage for Logan Gilbert. 25% K rate there. Suppression is far better. Only gives up a 213 average to the right-hander. Still doesn't walk anybody. And he induces more ground balls with less hard contact. And the Royals are going to throw out, what, probably six righty, five, six righties. They did just uh, send Eddie Oliveras down. Uh, so we'll have to see what they want to do with the lineup. But they've got Mikel Garcia, Bobby Witt at 5,900. That's a uh, an egregious price tag. Uh, there's no chance I play that. Salvi Perez still has swing and miss and chase problems um, behind the plate. 4,400, that's a fine price tag. But is this all that great a batted ball matchup for him? Not necessarily. And as I mentioned, MJ strikes out a crap load. So give me some Logan Gilbert here, 9,700 at half the ownership of... A guy like a Scherzer, um, similar ownership to Max Fried. I think these two guys, Gilbert and Max Fried, have plenty of upside to go after some pretty um, attackable lineups, right? We can absolutely go after the Yankees, right, with Max Fried and a high ground ball rate and, and whiffs. You can go after the Royals because of the Royals and their garbage. Um, they can't create. They strike out a lot, and they don't produce. So... Give me some Logan Gilbert, too. I got no problem. Every number against right-handers for the Royals is just dreadful, right? 85 WRC plus. There's 35% hard contact. That's great. But it doesn't translate into run creation because they have such a um, an attackable swing and miss rate, 23.5% here. This has ticked down quite a bit over the last month or so, a couple of ticks. Uh, but they still don't walk a lot, and they've only got one guy that's going to get on and steal bases, maybe two. Uh, with a, a Kyle Isbell or something like that. They don't hit for a lot of average, don't hit for a lot of power, they don't hit the ball over the wall. So I think the Royals are very much tackable here uh, with some Logan Gilbert. I'm not super thrilled with the price tag, 
at 97. I'd like it if it were a little bit cheaper, but there's still value that we could squeeze out of this. Um, certainly, well, mostly because of the low ownership figure. Brady Singer is going for the Royals 7,900. I think that's okay to play as well. Seattle sucks too. Like this team is just as bad. They have one of their left-handers, their leadoff hitter, uh, JP Crawford. He's on the DL. 104 WRC plus this season with a 26% K rate. They hit for a lower batting average, a little bit more power because they've got Julio, Gino, Cal Raleigh, and Tay Oscar there, um, but less hard contact and the same neutral ground ball to fly ball split. They also only walk at about an 8-9% clip here. It's you know three ticks higher uh, than the Royals, but it's still not 10 or 11% like we'll get to with San Diego, for example, in a minute. Um, so this tag, this Offense is very much attackable, too, and Brady Singer's been far, far better over his last seven, eight starts. Still has a clunker here and there, and we still have upside concerns for him. He's not a swing and miss type of guy. He's a heavy ground ball pitcher. And, well, mostly what's going to take me off here personally is 7900 I hate this price tag. He was 5200 like a month ago. Um, so, you know, do I want to go after Seattle? You know, yeah, generally I do, especially with guys that can induce ground balls because most of these guys over here won't hit it in the air outside of Cal Raleigh. Tay Oscar is going to hit it in the air a little bit, but he swings and misses when he's hitting off a tee. Julio I'm kind of scared of uh, at 5,500. He'll hit a lot of ground balls, though, so I'm okay taking some Brady Singer shots against him. Um Gino Suarez will get the baseball in the air a little bit and lift it. 3,900, that's an okay play. I do like Cal Raleigh's batted ball matchup here and certainly a pitch mix matchup with Brady Singer and just effectively a two-pitch guy without a changeup, sinker slider. That's a good matchup for Cal Raleigh uh, from the left side of the plate, hitting or getting to see a lot of the two-seamer here. Um, 4,500, think that's a fine catcher play. Dominic Canzoni in the outfield, 2,500, that's fine also. Uh, but, man, you get outside the top four, top five guys here, and you're throwing up pretty quickly with Seattle. So I think Brady Singer has to be very much in play, certainly at lower ownership. I do not like the price tag, and I do not like the fact that he's only a two-pitch guy. But I like the ground balls, and I like the matchup here a little bit. Um, I think he has to be kind of in play at a low ownership figure. I know I said that, you know, I generally want all of those categories to kind of meld and mesh together, um, but sometimes, you know, we don't get everything we want, right? So I think if you land on a 7,900 singer, 5, 8, 10% of your teams, this is fine. Do I want to come in over this number? No, oh, not particularly, because he was absolutely horrific earlier in the season, right? But um, he's been much better, and we kind of expected him to turn it around, and that's kind of what we've seen over his last six, eight starts. And he's getting another good matchup, so I've got really no serious issue. I don't really want to play much offense in this game. It's mostly pitching for me uh, outside of one-offs here or there. I love Michael Massey just in general, uh, and he's still cheap at 3000 He's similar to Eddie Julian for the Twins for me. Um, while, while he's this cheap, you know, young hitters that have some holes, definitely, but uh, a lot of upside at those price tags. I like him. Um, sure, you want to mix in a salvi. That's all right, uh, but... I mean, be my guest. You want to be playing 5,900 uh, Bobby Witt here tonight. No, thank you. And from the Mariners, mostly just like Cal Raleigh, Gino, and a Julio up top. You want to mix in a Tay Oscar. I think that's okay, too. But uh, not my favorite. Um, getting full st- – you want to mix in a full stack, throw in Tay Oscar and a, and a Canzoni or something. Um, I think that's all right. Not my favorite, though. Well down the, the board for me personally. Uh, I think Brady Singer kind of has to be in play. Okay, let's move on. We can get through this one really quickly. Um, Merrill Kelly, 8,100. Yeah, you can play him here. He's got six pitches that he goes to work with, and all of them are pretty okay. Um, break even at worst, and, you know, really, really good. And in, in, when we're talking about the changeup in particular, um, you know, cutter change here, like this two pitch combination is fantastic. Throws it about 40% of the time, really relies on this, and this will keep him down in the strike zone. So I think that makes him playable. He also has the two-seamer. He has a little bit of a slider. Curveball's probably going to get him in trouble here a little bit uh, at Coors Field, but he's got five other pitches that he can go to that won't necessarily get him in trouble at Coors Field, at altitude, that is. So I'm okay playing 8,100. I love playing Merrill Kelly. Um, I want to be careful with the ownership. I don't want to see this float too high uh, because popular pitchers at Coors Field is a recipe for disaster. 
But the price tag here at 8100 is fantastic, and I love playing Merrill Kelly. Uh, I, I've, I've been talking about him all season. I love playing. we got to keep an eye on him, though. He's now had... Uh, he had a blood clot in his right calf, and then he had the cramp. He had to come out of his last start with. So we got to be careful with him. Um, you know, can we predict that he's going to you know, hurt his calf again or anything? I mean, no. But um, 8,100 and attainable ownership here, 15%. I think this is fine if you land on some of this. I'm not going to come in over this. I'll probably come in under with like 10% of my teams, I would guess, or something. Uh, but this is a very attackable and winnable matchup for Merrill Kelly here at Coors Field against the Rockies. Uh, the offense is very young here, and they're very bad. So um, I got no problem playing a good bit of him. And we can get through Chris Flexen really quickly here. Zero chance I play any of him. 5,000, he'll probably go three innings if he even makes it that far. Um, just no value. The cutter has totally abandoned him. Um, now he's got five pitches you know, five or four and a half call it, you know, with the show me curveball here or whatever. Uh, but he's walking too many people. He's not throwing it past anybody. Um, he's not inducing ground balls at the same rate that he was, you know, earlier in his career. He's still getting some to the left-handers. That's a little bit of the cutter change going to work. Um, but for all intents and purposes, he's a neutral ground ball to fly ball. That gives up a 220x ISO, 396x Woba with a 313xBA here. Uh, no, thank you, right? Just way too many balls in the air at Coors Field. Um, and I love attacking average and below average arms with Arizona. They really excel in these matchups. So this is by far my favorite stack. I'm not shocking anybody here. Um, and it's by far the field's favorite stack as well. But uh, these numbers, like if they got Chris Flex in every single outing at Coors Field, you'd see these numbers double. Um you know, for all intents and purposes. So uh, there's a very good reason that their implied run total is at seven and a half right now. So uh, I am perfectly fine getting all of the Arizona I can stomach. Um, now, they did DFA yesterday Carson Kelly and activate Gabby Moreno, even though he wasn't in the lineup. He will be in, in there tonight. They did acquire Jace Peterson and Tommy Pham. All of these guys are cheap enough to make getting to Corbin Carroll and Cattell Marte um, very easy and very palatable. So you know, Chris Walker's only 5,200, for example. No problem playing every single one of them, and I'm going to end up playing every single one of them. I don't care who it is. Um, there's too much upside for them in this particular matchup. Um, you know, I, I very well may just, like, have 100% of Arizona tonight and just kind of see what happens. Who knows? So, that's uh, no pitching, at least for the Rockies. Some, some Merrill Kelly and all of the Arizona. I don't want to play much of Colorado really at all. Um, I don't like the price tags necessarily, and I really respect Merrill Kelly. I don't want to go after him. Uh, I love Zee Tovar, and now that um, Jerry Profar is probably going to be out for a little while, you can still play him. He's going to be leading off. That's fine. You want to play Ryan McMahon at 4,600? Uh, okay. Um, you know, whatever. That That's fine. Nolan Jones, fine too, but Brendan Rogers still cheap at 3,000. You can mix that in if you want to play like a uh, leverage piece against Merrill Kelly. I think that's fine. But uh, I'm probably not going to go out of my way to do it. The, the offense is just terrible. Okay, let's move on to Baltimore and San Diego. Try and get through these last two quickly. Grayson Rodriguez, 6,400. The price tag puts him in play here. So does the ownership, 11%. The matchup and the underlying fundamental metrics, however, probably take him out of play for most people. And it's mostly a 9% walk, 10% walk, or a 10% barrel rate. Yeah, we love whiffs, right? 25% K rates to both sides of the play. He's got a fantastic changeup. We have talked about this several times this season. The value on the changeup is elite, elite, elite tier. Even though he's only getting an out and a half above the field, it's a 14-mile-an-hour velo delta to his four-seamer, which is hovering at 97 miles an hour. It's his four-seamer that really leads him astray, and he gets, he, like, he pipes this. He doesn't have a lot of movement on it, and the location on it, you know, with the 10% walk rate, he can't establish with it. It's hard for him. So if he were to, well, you know, when he finally gets better value out of this four-seam fastball, you're going to see the value on this changeup absolutely skyrocket. If he can get this four-seamer to neutral relative to league average value, this changeup will be three and four outs above the field. It is that good. And you you just do not see a 14-mile-an-hour velocity delta on a changeup uh, to the fastballs. You just don't see it. It's such a good pitch. However, 
everything else is bad, right? The cutter is bad. Four-seamer is bad. Doesn't have swing and miss with the curveball. So despite the fact that he has swing and miss with the change, he's still giving up power, right, to left-handers. 42% hard contact, two and a half homers per nine, right? And that's still when he's inducing a buck 50 ground ball to fly ball. He's giving up a lot of power here, 280 ISO to the lefties with a 13% walk rate. So he's absolutely attackable. That's Juan Soto and Jay Cronenworth territory, of course. Um, they have Jimin Choi that they added at the deadline as well. He's a cheap first base play. Um, I think the Padres are an intriguing stack here. Not my favorite to kind of go out of my way, uh, but I love playing them when they're totally off the board in good matchups like this. And fundamentally, this is a pretty okay spot. Even right-handers, he's given up a little bit of power to. You know, 140 ISO is not uh, anything to write home about necessarily, but a 265 batting average uh, is definitely attackable. 35% hard contact you know, buck 40 ground ball to fly ball. These are somewhat attackable. You can go after this, certainly with a 24% line drive rate to right hander So Grayson is attackable here. Uh, 6,400, though, at the ownership. They, they do put him in play. Um, and the whiffs have to put him in play as well. That's how I want to go after the Padres when I do it. So really, I think both sides here are very much in play. I'm not super thrilled about a Hassan Kim at 4,900. Uh, I love the kid, but he's probably a bit expensive. Tatis at 61, that's okay. Soto at 56, I like this. Machado at 53, this is okay also, as is 48 for Xander Bogarts, maybe a bit stiff, um, but perfectly fine. He's Xander Bogarts, he's a fine hitter. Jay Cronenworth, 42, and the G-Man Choi, 25. I like that uh, a good bit. Probably not going to be Gary Sanchez tonight, likely to be Luis Camposano, um, but who knows. Mostly like to stick to the top six, top seven type of guys here if I'm getting to Padre stacks, and I think it's warranted. You could play both sides of this game. Uh, I do like a little bit of Grayson, though, at 6,400 in particular. It makes a lot of stuff happen. He's a fine tournament pivot off of a very popular Miles Michaelis, for example. Darvish at 8,700. Well, we like cheap you Darvish, right, at uh, 87. 23% ownership. I think this is fine. Not necessarily anything I want to go out of my way to, uh, you know, try and uh, exploit to the upside, right, because this is a tough matchup. Baltimore got Cedric Mullins back, and they have a lot of lefties over here, and that's, you know, Darvish still giving up some pop, right, to the left side. 180 ISO, 261 batting average, neutral ground ball to fly ball, 31% hard contact. Um, that's attackable. Even though he's got the whiffs at 27%, he still give up some power a little bit. 58% strike one. It's actually ticking down from where it was earlier in the season, hovering at about 59 and 60 so Darvish, not overly, you know, not just like a super smash play. That's why I don't think 25% ownership is all that exploitable for us you know, to come in over the field. He's still got a 420 ERA here. Maybe running a little cold in terms of the expected suppression. Maybe have a, you know, third of a run coming to him positively in that respect. But, you know, for the most part, a 4-0 ERA, similar to Scherzer, is a 4-0 ERA. I'd rather play Darvish if I had to choose between him and Scherzer. If I get a, you know, just grab a 4-0 ER, ERA out of nowhere because, well, he's 2300 cheaper, right? So give me some Darvish. I definitely want to play some um, because he's got 24 pitches here and he's using them all pretty much in every single start. And we saw what, for example, a guy that throws a hell of a lot of strikes in George Kirby the other day did to Baltimore with a complete game shutout. Do I think Darvish has that in the tank? Probably not. Because uh, he pitches to a little bit too much contact. Walk rate is a little bit higher, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but he's still very viable at 8,700. Kirby was 10,000, right? That, that's perfectly fine to play some Darvish here, and I've got no problem doing it. Um, however, I want to play some Baltimore on the other side as well. I like Rutch. Eh, I don't like the price tag, but I like Rutch in general. Gunner's got incredible numbers against right-handers this season. He's at 5,000, kind of stiff there. Santander from the left side, heavy fly ball hitter. That's fine to go after a little bit of Darvish here at 45. Yeah, it's okay. Ryan O'Hearn is still cheap at 3,000. Cedric, probably going to be in the five hole at 4,300. I like that a good bit. Good numbers for the Orioles in aggregate against right-handed pitching. Darvish is an above-average right-hander, and we generally want to go after below-average right-handers with Baltimore, similar to Arizona. Uh But I've got no problem playing some leverage here because Darvish is going to get a little bit of ownership. So, um you can certainly play. This isn't like an overly 
uh, pitcher-friendly ballpark as it used to be down here at Petco because, you know, they adjusted the fences a little bit. So made it a little bit more hitter-friendly, and it's still 75 balmy in San Diego tonight. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. Play both, pretty much everybody in this game. I think this is a really, really interesting tournament game. Um, I think you might have to get some pieces here right in order to get there in tournaments tonight. All right, let's get to the last game here. Tyler Glass now on the mound for Tampa uh, in San Francisco. Ryan Walker's going to open for them. Uh, it'll be Sean Manaya most likely. Uh, we'll get to that in a sec. Glass now 10-8. I hate this price tag, but I love the fundamental matchup. Um, you know, San Francisco still striking out a lot, right? 25% strikeout rate against righties this year. 10% walk rate, below average creation, and this is park adjusted, so. Um, they're at their home ballpark now, so these numbers are going to be you know, a, quite a bit worse. 65 degrees in San Francisco. Um, buck 60 ISO, yeah, they got a little bit of pop, but they're not going to hit for a lot of average, and they're going to strike out a lot. And that's really kind of Tyler Glass now's MO, right? A lot of strikeouts. He will give up some power to left-handers, and he has a super worrying barrel rate here. We got 12 starts in the guy, 68 and two-thirds this year. 16% barrel rate, that's a that's a serious concern. So if you want to come off of a 10-8 price tag because of a very high barrel rate, like you're not going to get any argument from me whatsoever. Giving up two homers per nine, despite a 2-to-1 ground ball to fly ball ratio against the lefties so far this year, 242 ISO. It's a big, big numbers right there uh, against the left side. So they're going to platoon over here. If you want to play some Lamont Wade, who doesn't strike out a lot, that's fine. Jock Peterson still hasn't, seen a lot of the uh, raw power materialize, but historically, um, you know, excellent numbers against right-handers. I'd rather just side with Glass now because 35% strikeouts is incredibly difficult to get through despite a 15% barrel rate if you're an opposing offense. Um, he's efficient early. He's mostly efficient pretty late, just an 8% walk rate. And he's got elite chase here and a 34% CSW. I mean, this is incredibly hard to get through. Uh, especially in San Francisco in 65 degree weather. So give me the give me Glass now, and I'd like to play him at reduced ownership compared to Scherzer. I said it was half earlier; it's roughly you know 10% lower or whatever. Um, but he's cheaper, and I think the matchup for him is slightly better. Even though you know Scherzer gets the Angels, uh, I like Glass now's overall profile here a little bit better than Scherzer's. I don't think he's got as much negative regression coming to him. Um, but mostly, I want to go after San Francisco. They strike out at a pretty healthy clip still. So I got no problem playing both of them. I prefer Glass now, but it's not really uh, mostly because, I guess, of the lower ownership, but not really a huge difference there necessarily. Uh, you're going to have to balance a price tag, though, because that's hard to get to. Um Ryan Walker is going to open. He's got fantastic numbers as an opener this year. He's only going to go an inning, maybe two. So that kind of takes me off of any Tampa that I was would have considered otherwise. It's likely to be Ryan, um, Sean Manaya rather, uh, coming in after Ryan Walker. But who the hell knows what Gabe Kapler is going to do down here? Like, there's been several occasions this season where Manaya has been the probable long reliever, and he's come in and thrown an inning, and he hasn't even been the second guy out of the bullpen or the first guy out of the bullpen, the second guy to come into the game. So can't really play him. He's 54 or 5,600 or something like that. Um, can't really deal with that, even though Tampa's been a little bit more attackable recently with the strikeouts, certainly. They still create a hell of a lot. Um, and this, I mean, this is against right-handers, but their numbers against lefties are basically identical. Um, so it's either Ryan Walker or Sean Manaya. I don't want to go after Ryan Walker because he induces ground balls. He's got whiffs. And... I don't want to stack Tampa because they're going to see probably four different arms tonight, at least. So that takes them out of play. And, you know, not to sort of bury the lead here, the game is also in San Francisco in 65-degree weather. So um, kind of hard to get excited about Tampa outside of, I don't know, maybe a Luke Rayley a little bit, but he's going to be in the downside of the platoon. They might play some platoon shenanigans over here, Tampa, and try and play matchups uh, similar to the Giants. So you're going to see a lot of... Likely to see a lot of pinch hitting here tonight between these two teams. Like, both of these managers, they just go freaking crazy playing the matchups. It's super frustrating for DFS. So, for the most part, the game is totally a washout for me outside of uh, a good bit of glass now. I don't want any offense. I just don't want to deal with it. If it burns me, it burns me. But, um, you know, whatever. 
Okay, so I think that is it. Uh, it is the last game. It is the last game. Look at that. So let's quickly go over a review, and we will get out of here. Pittsburgh and the Mets. Like Pittsburgh a little bit here. Um, going after some cookie. I think if you land on either of these guys price adjusted on the mound, that's fine. 53 for Priester and 6K for Cookie Carrasco. It's okay, but fundamentally, every single number is going to tell you to stay away. And that's kind of how I'm going to side here and just get to some offense. Short Mets stacks, um, you know, top guys from the Mets and pretty much everybody from Pittsburgh, you know, the top yeah, two-thirds of the lineup, you know, top six there. Jack Sawinski, I like a good bit here tonight. Uh, and some right-handers, too. Um, you know, McCutcheon and, you know, don't – fade Brian Reynolds just because he hit two dingers yesterday. Yankees Atlanta. Yankees short stacks I think could be in play here. Is it really off the board tournament play against Max Freed? Uh, but I like Max Freed at low ownership too. 9,400. I'd like him a little bit cheaper, but I'm okay playing that because he's got so many ground balls and a lot of whiffs too. Uh, but upside can get capped for him a little bit sometimes. Um, so if you want to go after him with a couple of fly baller types from the Yankees, uh, Judge Glaber is neutral. Uh, Stanton and Harrison Bader types, that's okay. Um, don't really have a big issue with that. Atlanta, sure. I mean, if you can make it happen, you can stack them every damn day. I think Clark Schmidt is in play here a little bit, though, uh, against right-handers. Um, he's got really good numbers. It's He's very susceptible against lefties. 7,700, I like him a little bit cheaper for this particular matchup. But I think he could survive here. This is a hard spot for him, so I'm not going to go out of my way to target this. But 5, 8, 10% of your teams with Clark Schmidt, I don't think it's horrible. I'll probably come in somewhere around there, probably under, but uh, I don't think it's bad at all. A lot of playable stuff there in that game. Oakland-St. Louis, um, give me some Oakland stacks here against Michaelis as leverage. Give me a little bit of Michaelis, but certainly nowhere near 30%. Um, and give me a little bit of St. Louis against J.P. Sears. Mostly short stacks, I think. Arenado, Contreras. Jordan Walker, my favorites, mix in some Tyler O'Neill and obviously Goldschmidt, too, if you want to go with a full stack. But from Oakland, give me a Seth Brown, J.J. Bladé, uh, Jordan Diaz is fine. Soderstrom behind the plate um, or at first base, that's fine, too. Any of these guys, Brent Rooker, you know, that's fine, too. Michaelis has a high line drive range to both sides, so he's attackable in that respect. Angels, Texas, no, very little Patty Sandoval for me. Um, if you land on him, it's probably okay as a tournament pivot off of Michaelis, um, but very little. I just hate going after Texas. This is a good damn offense over here. Scherzer, yeah, sure, uh, but like 11,000, I'd probably just rather play Glass now. Um, but he, he's okay. It's just a price tag and an ownership thing you got to balance there. You can make some Texas stacks happen. I'm okay doing that. Not my favorite going after Patty because I do respect the ground ball rate. Uh, but he's going to pitch, pitch to some contact here, and they got a lot of fly ball hitters over here still, even with the absence of Josh Young. So that's fine. Uh, no real problems there. A lot of playable stuff in that game. From the Angels, mostly just Shohei. Uh, Seattle and KC, give me a lot of Logan Gilbert. Uh, I like the spot for him. I like the price tag. Well, it's okay, price tag. And I really mostly like the matchup. Um, Kansas City, I'm going to stay off of for the most part. I'll get have some Michael Massey, maybe some Salvi. But uh, outside of that, just give me a lot of the Gilbert. Um, Brady Singer, I'm going to have a little bit of him as well. 7,900. Not super thrilled about the price tag for him, but I like the matchup for him, too. Seattle just stinks, man. This is a garbage offense. Um, from Seattle, give me some Cal Raleigh, though. I like the matchup for him here. And Dominic Canzoni in the outfield, I think that's okay as well at 2,500 as a filler piece. You want to run a three-man, sure, mix in a Julio, mix in a Teoscar, you know, kind of whatever. But mostly siding with Brady Singer here uh, and Logan Gilbert on the mound as opposed to offense. Arizona... All of them, every single one of them, and a little bit of Merrill Kelly, too, at Coors Field tonight against Chris Flexen. No Flexen and very little Colorado. I'll have like a one-off here or there, probably, but no stacks for me. I'm just going to fade them. I think they're just terrible. Uh, Baltimore and San Diego, um, very interesting tournament game, as we mentioned. Everybody is in play here. Uh, mostly Darvish for me and some sneaky San Diego stacks, I think. Uh, but Grayson is also in play at, at reduced ownership as another uh, option in the 6K range to pivot off of the Michaelis shenanigans. Um, and some Baltimore off of a little bit of the Darvish ownership, too. Don't think this is bad, really, at all. Excuse me, I really like uh, Cedric Mullins at 4,300. I think this is a, a decent spot. Tampa and San Francisco, mostly just glass now here for me. And I'm going to stay off of pretty much everybody else in the game because these guys are just going to platoon, and I don't know what the hell they're going to do. So makes it hard on me. 
All right, that's it. We're done here. Keep an eye out for projections and ownership updates as always, and good luck to everybody here on this eight-game Monday.